<clears throat> Welcome uh, again to the Sons of Life. And uh, we really appreciate the Lord. We have been uh, <clears throat> off air for some time, being uh, involved uh, in uh, uh, evangelistic campaigns here and there. But uh, we are back in the Sons of Life. And uh, just uh, to recap some of the things that uh, we were going through uh, before, uh, before, before we left off, I'd like us to see some of the things that uh, we were going through before we got off. So previously, we were looking at uh, uh, the issue of uh, cover cropping, how to um, intercrop and uh, give uh, diverse soil biology to uh, uh, to uh, our soil and. Uh, uh, provide uh, a, a good environment for our crops. And so while we were looking at uh, cover cropping, we saw oh, we need to have a, a least expensive implement of getting uh, our soil balance. And uh, another uh, thing that uh, we were looking at was uh, uh, intercropping or uh, cover cropping with native species like uh, sorghum, millet, uh, legumes, amaranth, yellow sunflower, that is tectonia as it is known, uh, so that uh, the, the main reason for cover cropping is to help in uh, a prevention, so, uh, prevention of soil erosion and uh, it will also help us uh, with uh, a small uh, we, with a little piece of land we have so that uh, we may have cover crops for if we have animals that they may get um, their food also. Uh, and then uh, while uh, looking at uh, creating our own soil bio biology, uh, we looked at uh, soil uh, inoculation, the introduction of certain desirable bacteria in the soil. As a, a practice, it is very old, having been followed many years before it is beneficial influence was understood. And so uh, welcome brother Kore and uh, others who are joining in. And uh, it's good uh, once again to be here and uh, see what the Lord has to speak to us. And uh, uh, it was just recapping where we left where we were looking at cover cropping, amending the soil, creating our own soil biology uh, in this uh, series of uh, Sounds of Life. Uh, we saw about uh, organic gardening, soil inoculants, uh, uh, the types of bacteria added to the soil to seed the soil. And so uh, I don't know where you will pick it from, we, 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 we left at a highly dominated fungal soil opposed to high bacterial uh, dominated soil. And uh, we were looking at uh, how fungi are generally much more efficient at assimilating and storing nutrients than uh, bacteria. That's why we were looking at uh, uh, which one is good opposed to the other. And so uh, we were to go to uh, uh, that is natural pest control. I think that is where we were looking at uh, natural pest control and uh, even sharing the experiences we have had with our own uh, uh, farming practices. So what you have gone through uh, in your farm for the last two years, I'm just picking up. Mine is like uh, three to two to three months old. And so the challenges we are meeting here and there 
but um, we can look at what is the natural way of uh, pest control and how can we increase the shelf uh, longevity of uh, the produce that we have. Welcome, Brother Corey. Well, I'm glad I could finally get here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so you're saying we made it to, man, yeah, it's been such a long time. I'm trying to remember where, where yeah. we're at. Um, Lastly, we looked at making our own fertilizer manure to balance the nutrients, and then uh, uh, the tillage impact on soil. Uh, and then we were going to uh, this uh, natural pest control, the natural ways of uh, controlling pests in our, our gardens, maybe in our farms. Mm. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I mean, there's a few ways. Hold on. Man, that's going to be so... Where do we want to go with natural pest control? It's not a big... It's not an area, it's not an area that I have a lot of study and experience in right now. And the reason I say that, I mean, I'm studying more, I'm trying to understand what do I gotta do to get a plant as healthy as possible so that it will be completely pest resistant itself without any of these things. However, obviously that takes time and there are situations in the meantime, while we're trying to build a system where we do need some, potentially we do need some type of pest controls, but we're su such a broad topic of uh, things, you know, you, you've got aphids, I mean, maybe that's how we should look at it as various, various sucking insects, aphids, mites, those tiny, little tiny things. Yes. Um, often we would use, you know, some kind of like a horticultural oil, soap, these types of things to be able to, uh, spray it on there and that would smother those type of type of pests and suffocate them, kill them. Um, potentially even um, that would be true of scale as well. Um, in those particular cases, sometimes you can just take a hose, if you got some pressure then you can spray them off just with water and not, it'll knock them off. Um, other things you can do is watch for you can watch for uh, a lot of times with those type of insects, you'll you'll see ants. Ants will be going up and down the plants because they're farming sugars off from the aphids and stuff, and they protect the aphids. And if you can, sometimes if you can control the ants from getting on the plants to farm those type of insects, your natural predators like ladybugs can get in there and clean up the mess of the pests. Um, especially ladybugs, not only, the ladybug larva is even more powerful at that than they look, they look really strange. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a um, larval stage of a ladybug, but it doesn't look anything like a ladybug. It looks quite root, it looks quite almost kind of terrifying. <laughs> But they, they, uh, they really devour up the aphids and such. So relying on natural predators, that can help with uh, in any type of ecosystem. If you've got some areas planted around the garden area that is growing 
uh, lots of diversity of various flowers and various things, habitat for these, ins for predator insects to hide and live and to get nutrition that way, um, keep them nearby. You'll notice, especially flowering, and you'll notice lots of stuff coming to various flowers. If you can keep various flowers throughout the year um, in, in like a wild section, whether it's on the property or nearby or whatever, you're just trying to draw in natural um, predators that can help um, with the system. Yeah, and uh, talking about uh, maybe uh, pest repellent uh, crops, uh, which ones will you maybe uh, 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 say that uh, they are good at uh, uh, really repelling the pest where, when you're talking about uh, uh, mm. uh, crops that are pest repellent? Uh, you know what, that, as far as the crop itself, like you're growing like, some people will say you can grow like a marigold and, or an onion and these type of plants will uh, actually, the, the smell and stuff or things, something that they put off actually repels pests. Um, I really can't say much about that because I don't know exactly how effective it really is. Um, it might be, that's something that people are going to have to look into, but it, it is something there are, that is something I really don't know much about. Um, it's not something I've personally really tried to do or experienced, but I do know people talk about it. Um, companion planting, various things that you can plant that the plant itself um, repels these these type of insects. Now it's, but it's, it's also, I would say it's also important to understand in this particular area of why are these insects coming to eat the particular plant or suck the particular plant. And it's usually, in most cases, it's usually a pretty common thing that they are, they are coming because there are typically excess nitrogens that are, whether it's in a nitrate form or an ammonium form that are still in the leaf and it's building up in the leaf, it's not getting used by the plant. Um, and these are building up and these insects will get that and use, and use it to uh, build their own um, proteins and structures and stuff. So you're typically looking at a situation where excess nitrogens are building up in leaves instead of being used. What you want in an ideal situation, what happens every 24 hours is when a plant takes up nitrogen, that nitrogen is either A, it's, it's being formed into the chlorophyll molecule around magnesium, or it's also especially being built into proteins and those proteins become part of plant structure. Um, and what happens is there are various, I mean, there's numerous things, but uh, imbalances, imbalances can uh, in the soil, our practices of what we're trying to feed the plant. Um, you can too much manures or too much fertilizer, um, various things missing, various minerals like molybdenum, um, cobalt, various things that are, might be missing are inhibiting the plant from being able to take all of that nitrogen and turn it into proteins on a daily basis and get rid of it. Um, so that it's not just free nitrogen building up in the plant. So when you see sucking insects, that's a sign to you that there are more than likely nitrates or ammonium some forms of nitrogen that are building up in that plant that these insects are after. And uh, of course, too much of any one mineral is going to be inhibiting other minerals. But nitrogen is a very common one to potentially get excess of, but it, ne it doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean that the, the 
it's a weird thing because it doesn't mean that the plant is necessarily getting too much nitrogen. It just means that it's not getting metabolized and it's missing some various uh, minerals perhaps, or something is going on that's keeping that plant from being able to metabolize that nitrogen to get it put into protein structures that are too difficult for the, that the plants don't want. They just want the free, easy stuff. That's why they're sucking, particularly sucking insects. They just want to get into that leaf and suck out the nutrients. Um, and this is also true of, of, of simple sugars and, and stuff. And the plant hasn't built up an immunity to be able to defend itself against this. And so it's after some simple sugars where we want these uh, sugars in a, in a plant being transported to the leaf areas to be able to be um, used as energy. But if the, if the sugars aren't being used or dumped into the uh, roots and dumped down to the biology to feed the biology as efficiently and, um, as it should be for various reasons, then you can have those sugars in there. And that's also bringing the insects to, to feed on these things. So, you know, balanced nutrition, uh, that's, it's just important. The, the point here is it's just important to understand when, it, when we're looking at some type of control to control these insects, it's always just good to understand the typically the main reason why the insects are there in the first place. They're, they're there because there's something unhealthy about this plant. It's got, uh, a, an imbalance or it's not being, it's not you being able to utilize what it's got and the plants are saying here. I mean, the insects, here's a place where we can eat, we can get this stuff. So it's, it's good to, to know that, that piece of information. So the issue again, just, uh, comes to, um, uh, soil biology because uh, if uh, if you will uh, try to correct the plant biology and uh, the soil biology is not corrected, then uh, it will be hard to to deal with the pest. Is that the, the issue? Yeah, uh, yeah. Over time, over time, it, it it just depends because I mean it could be a situation where let's say let's say a person doesn't have molybdenum. In the soil and molybdenum is it's it's used in an important enzyme called the nitrate reductase enzyme so if molybdenum is in short supply and not available to the plant then it doesn't have the enzyme to be able to take that nitrogen that nitrate and reduce it down to ammonium and ultimately um amine and into uh um being able to into, put it into proteins so that nitrate builds up in the plant and that's it could be biology related but it could be just simply hey this soil needs to be tested for molybdenum and is it missing molybdenum i think if i remember right in your case that there was there was a decent amount of molybdenum so you're probably not having an issue like right now you know we're just getting ready to start winter but we got our winter gardens and everything and and although i definitely see some some various deficiencies, some issues from some things in my uh, garden. And we don't have, I haven't noticed, like I was telling this to my wife the other day, I go, I haven't seen a single aphid on anything in our garden so far this fall, winter, anywhere on anything. And mm -hmm. that seems to be suggesting to me that nitrogen is being used up, used. And as a matter of fact, the, the, I'm having the opposite problem. I can tell by looking at the plants that some of the th I had put down cals I had put down some lime in some areas and some sulfur in other areas to lower pH, raise pH. And when you do that and plant immediately, it can it can be an inhibitory have an inhibitory effect on the plant being able to get nitrogen. So I see nitrogen deficiencies in my plant. So I don't have excess nitrogen in my case. I have a lack of nitrogen. And at this particular time, the um, now that can open it up and make it the plant susceptible to different kinds of insects. But typically when you have a lack of nitrogen, you may not see uh, sucking insects come in. And we don't, we don't see any sucking insects at this particular point because there's a lack of nitrogen, but we do want to build that up because eventually here we'll probably see 
some maybe like some chewing insects come in because I have seen some caterpillars. Caterpillars um, are going to be a higher, they are higher level of insect than aphids. And so they're not necessarily just going after um, simple nitrogen and stuff. They're actually eating and chewing, eating up the leaf structure yeah. and stuff. So we're talking about, okay, well, this is a higher, we need a higher level of plant immunity and plant resistance to be able to protect against those caterpillars. Um, so, so that, yeah, the, but over time, typically a lot of this stuff may just be, because there's all, lots of other minerals that can play a part in this. And, and maybe it's just a situation where a plant is missing. It might not be molybdenum. There might be some other things that the plant is missing. And um, it may be in the soil, but it, the biology has not um, bloomed to the point to where it's uh, being able to break down that stuff in the soil and get it to the plant. And so we just need more time in developing the biology, which as you already, you had mentioned when I first got on there, growing cover crops, always trying to keep things growing, always trying to keep living roots in the system to feed that biology and watching the plants to make sure, you know, we're trying to learn what's going on with the plant. Is this plant, because it's all about the, the better that plant is photosynthesizing, the higher capacity it has of photosynthesis, the more sugar it's dumping into the ground and feeding more biology. I mean, it really breaks down to being that simple. The more the plant is able to photosynthesize and produce sugars and things for that biology, it will dump it down there and grow that biology. And not only, and not just in a general sense, that plant there's actually communication going on where that plant knows what minerals it needs and it will put out various forms of food for specific bacteria or fungi signaling to that, that um, biology that it needs this mineral. It needs this mineral. And if you get it to me, I will feed you. And so they will feed that specifically in order to get that particular mineral, mineral because that biology will go and farm that particular mineral for them so long as it's in the soil. And if it's not in the soil, the plant never gets it and eventually the plant stops trying to feed that specific thing. But if, if it's in the soil, the biology will get to it and feed it. And then of course, eventually the pest and disease issues uh, begin to drop off from there. But obviously it takes some time and some practices to be able to get get there. It's definitely, uh, it's harder for us on a small, smaller scale when we don't necessarily have all the perfect testing. I mean, some of the, these commercial guys nowadays over here in the United States, they, they, they on a weekly basis, they're sending in leaf samples for, for sap analysis testing and that, and it tests everything and sees what, where, each single mineral at that's in that sap of that plant. So they know what is out of balance and what is in balance and everything. And it really helps those guys. So, you know, I'm just trying to do a lot of study and learn and it's like, okay, I gotta be able to try to learn how to do this the best I can in my situation because there's just no way I can do that with, you know, so many different crops and because, and the expense of it, it's just, it would it's not practical for us um yeah, yeah and uh, really the issue narrows down to how practical can uh, maybe can relieving be uh and uh, the issue of uh, no buying and selling and how we can be able to control these crops but uh, you find that uh, there's a lot of investment in uh, pest control rather than looking at the soil itself how right uh, it's doing and then uh, we, we miss a lot and we spend a lot while we could have avoided uh, many things to do with the uh, pest control by just uh, following simple uh, methods of uh, soil biology to make sure that uh, the crop itself is uh, pest resistant in that case. Right, yeah, it's the same thing with human health. You know, oh, I've got a problem. And we try yes. to treat that problem instead of realizing that the curse without a cause does not come. You know, there's a, 
there's something's happening for a reason. There's something that is going on in our system that we're either eating or doing whatever it may be that is hurting our immune system that's allowing this pest or disease or whatever to manifest itself. And it's the disease is not the problem. It's, and the pest, same thing with the plants. It's the disease and the pest are not the problem. The problem is somewhere in the system that we need to try to study and figure out. And it's not always easy because when you're dealing with such a complex system of so many different minerals, a, a holistic system, a lot of things affect, there's so many things that affect each other. It's, it's not that easy to figure out, especially when we don't have necessarily the, the, the testing methods. So it's, it's more of a, okay, well, how can we do this? Like you're saying, we got a come, time coming when no one can buy or sell. We just need to learn some basic principles and, and, and we just do the best we can. And that in this particular case, primarily is going to be, you know, learning these principles of developing the biology in the soil. And that it happens to be, you know, keeping plants on that soil, keeping that soil moist, keeping that soil from getting baked by the sun. Um, you know, using tillage in a, in a proper way. Don't, you know, if we need, if we need to till for various reasons, do it. But if, if we don't, then if, then then don't um it just depends on your particular circumstances uh these types of things but yeah and then but obviously we're still in the point of uh in the meantime what do we do if we do have a pest and you know the biggest thing i think that we should do in this particular case I would just recommend people, if you've got a, a, a particular pest at this particular time, you're still developing your system. Obviously, you can't, you, you might, it could be a situation where you can just let it run its course. The pest is not doing enough damage to really hurt anything. Or if the pest really is doing, taking out and doing a lot of damage, then you got to do something. And you just have really, the best thing to do is just do some search and study for your own particular area to find out what you might have available to you to be able to deal with um, certain pests that are in your particular case, because everybody's just gonna be different and you might have different things that are available to you. Some people will use, you know, maybe like a, a, a cayenne pepper, some type of hot pepper and, they can crush that up and put that into a spray and spray that on insects. Um, just, there's just various things that can be potentially used depending on your, your circumstances. And each individual, I would just recommend them to, to search and find that out for themselves. What you got there, Sammy? Yeah, I just wanted to take you maybe around and uh show you what is happening because uh, I don't know how we can address what we are going through like this. It's not just uh, about dryness, but uh, it's kind of the spinach are being affected so much um, other than the other vegetables. Uh -huh. Also, you can see the kale, so the skumawiki are, are okay. Yeah. And, uh, the, the other vegetables are okay, but uh, the spinach right. and uh, the tomatoes not doing good. These are the tomatoes. Okay. Well, they grow. Those are growing, and the tomatoes are growing in pots, right? Yes. I mean, that's going to have that's going to have its own difficulties because of root root restriction. Um, tomatoes are a plant that are heavy, heavy feeders, and um, look at the tomatoes and look at the bottom. The, uh, is the disease and problems starting from the bottom of the plant and moving up the plant? Uh, not really. Not really? It's yes. all over it? Or? You can see this. Ah, yeah. 
That looks. That's on the. Is that on the bottom or the side? It's on the bottom of the tomato itself. I, I thought okay, you were talking. Okay, so that, about that's plant. So that's blossom and rot. That's blossom and rot, and mm -hmm. that is the problem. That plant is not getting the calcium it needs for for that tomato to develop properly. And in either a there's a few things here. Either a there's a shortage of calcium in the soil, or B, the, the soil moisture is not enough and consistent enough because calcium needs, it's, it's, it's gotta be delivered constantly. And if, if the soil is not moist enough on a consistent basis, then you're not getting the, that, uh, that calcium to that plant. It could be a situation of, okay, well also what is the pH of that soil? Um, but yeah, the issue there is clearly a on the blossom end rot. That is an easily known one of, of a calcium issue. So the, the way to correct that is getting calcium into the system, into the soil, um, if, if it needs calcium. It may just simply need water. Um, I don't know what's going on with the watering practice with there. Is there anything, <coughs> do you, as far as, as far as in that particular potting mix, Sammy, do you know, we, I mean, we don't have a soil test on that or anything, so we don't necessarily know what there might, as far as the um, calcium levels on that, or do we know what the pH is or anything? Do we know any information about that soil, that particular soil mixture in that pot? Maybe what uh, I can just say that uh, uh, we, we, we shall try to increase uh, the calcium and then uh, see what happens. We, we want to make other beds and uh, see if uh, we can increase uh, uh, calcium by uh, adding some lime in the soil and see what happens in the next uh, uh, segment uh, of uh, vegetable planting. Right. Yeah. Now, if you have some... Uh... If you take some like eggshells, you could take some eggshells and crush that up as fine as you possibly can. And mix some vinegar in it. You can dissolve a lot of that calcium into the solution. And then you can heavily dilute it down with water. And then you can use that as a direct, you can use that to potentially spray it on the plant and the plant can get the, the calcium in that way, or I believe you can even use it as a root drench so you can get that calcium into the soil for the plant. But it's also gonna, it's also, I will say, you know, tomato plants are heavy feeders and they wanna put out a big root system. So there's gonna be restriction in a pot either way. So that's part of the, the issue too, is tomatoes growing in a pot are, are gonna be, it's gonna be a little bit harder on them because they want, they really want to put out and get out um, some nutrition. So, so <laughs> what you are saying that uh, we may be having a calcium problem or uh, the water intake may be another problem that uh, we may be facing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we look into those two situations and see uh, actually what is happening there. Yeah, and if there's any way for you to check the pH, I mean, if the pH happens to be below six, you're probably in a situation where there's some um, calcium deficiencies. Okay. If you're below six um, for that plant. Also, like I said, yeah, the, the pot, obviously you can't do much about the pot right now, but yeah, trying to get, get it some more water um, because that water will, do, water helps move, deliver calcium into the plant and it just needs it on a very regular basis to to be able to keep taking that calcium up and delivering it especially when it's trying to form tomatoes because you'll get that blossom end rot and it's specifically a, a calcium issue and sometimes if have you ever grown a tomato where it's ripening and it's it's turning red tomatoes turning red 
but the top of the tomato stays kind of yellow or green. Have you ever seen that before on a tomato? No, 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 no. I haven't seen that. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, if you if you if you see a, a tomato and it's ripening, it's turning red, but the top of it near the stem is staying yellow or or even green. It's not getting red like the rest of the tomato. Eventually, that's a sign that there's a potassium deficiency. This potassium but, plays a big role in fruit, and so that's the other side of the the tomato. So keep that a keep that an eye out on that. That'll let you know that you have a potassium deficiency. But right now, obviously, you have a calcium deficiency. You're not even getting to the point where the tomatoes even going to get anywhere near fully ripe. And they're rotting right on the plant. And that's that's pretty much happening to all the tomatoes? Uh, there is just a picture, not all of them. Okay. Some of them are making it? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So, it's a situation where, okay, you are getting some calcium, but just not enough. And that's okay. why that's happening. Now, the issue of, of this of the spinach, I don't know. I didn't see the video, but you have Maybe. shown pictures in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the good thing will be to try and see, uh, make another bed, and uh, uh, yeah, increase the calcium or uh, uh, increase the pH level, and see what happens. Be, right. be, because as the we have been saying that um, much of the paste uh, actually can be because of uh, the soil is not worked up well or uh, it's not uh, having a, a good balance of the nutrients. And so we need to check because we may be just addressing the effects of some of these things when uh, we are not looking at the cause of it. Right. Anything maybe yeah. you'd like to add up on uh, paste or... Uh, because the, the, the next thing will be shelf uh, longevity. Uh, how do we have crops that uh, maybe may have a long uh, shelf life? Mm. Yeah, we can go, we can move forward. Let's go ahead and move forward because like I said, the, the pest thing, the pest thing as far as specifically, what do I do right now this minute to control a pest because it's completely devouring stuff. That is something I would just tell most people to uh, do some local res research and find what you might have available that you can apply currently that's not going to be harmful, you know, putting any poison in the system, but it can take care of the pest. I mean, these are th there's all kinds of information you can find online for stuff like that. Um, so that's probably the best thing to do in, in that given situation. And we can go on to the next next one. You said uh, longevity. Yes. Uh, welcome, Dr. Florence. We we are just talking about uh, a pest uh, control, natural way of pest control, and uh, there's uh, a new person, Sarah Seraite. Uh, welcome to. Maybe if uh, before we go to shelf uh, longevity, with the few minutes we are remaining with, if uh, you may be having any question, Sister Florence and. Uh, uh, our new friends joining in. Yeah, let's open it up for questions on anything. But well, Sister Florence, did you give your first? I, have, I can see you have unmuted yourself, but we can't hear you. Still, we can't hear Sister Florence, but... Uh, okay, can, can we maybe go to shelf longevity? We have like uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Right. Uh, this is, I don't know if this is an area. I, I wish I had uh, um, Joshua here 
I really shelf longevity. I don't know if I can really say much on shelf longevity. It's not a topic I know a lot of information about as far as when we get fruits and vegetables. And if, if it's like, obviously it's going to be species dependent. Some things last longer than others. And, and, uh, I just don't really, at this time, I don't really know the answer to the issue of why why won't this stuff hold up very long? Um, or what can we do to make it hold up longer? Other than, I just, in general, the healthier you, your plants become, the, the better shelf life you're gonna get from the various thing, various plants. Now, you know, typically calcium is going to help. There's, it's a structure thing. Calcium, silica, those two things would help with um, structure, at least on the vegetable part. The fruit part, I'm not really sure. It's That's something, yeah, it's an area that I really don't know enough about to speak much on, Sammy. Okay, thank you. Then maybe we can, we can have uh, Joshua taking us through our shelf longevity and uh, how maybe naturally we, naturally we can uh, preserve foods. Uh, yeah, I'll or, see if uh, I can get him back next week. Uh, our produce so that uh, they can last for a long time without using these chemicals. That will be what we shall be dealing with if you get him <clears throat> uh, next week. Uh, uh, we shall be dealing with shelf longevity and uh, natural way of uh, preserving our produce. Yeah, he might have some answers for that. I don't really know. <clears throat> what, other, what other areas do we really wanna dive into? Um, No, I see on number seven we had uh, the key minerals for photosynthesis. Uh -huh. Maybe I don't know what uh, you may be planning about them. You gave out the eight-part series which we have to go through. Yeah, that that series is really good, isn't it? The key minerals for photosynthesis. Um. It might even be a good idea just to, to go to, to kind of go in depth about each mineral. Yeah. What does it, it helps when we understand what each mineral does, it can help us recognize some problems, deficiencies, um, this sort of thing when we understand what each one does. Yeah, this, this, this would be good in understanding actually the plant biology when uh, we are dealing with this uh, uh, key mineral so that uh, you may know if uh, such and such a part of the plant is doing like this, you are lacking this and that, uh, right. get into minute details of uh, uh, what the plant is lacking by, uh, by, by a nutrient, a specific nutrient. Right, yeah. Yeah. We can do that. So I think that what is on the list are the two items that is, uh, if you get in uh, Joshua, he can take us through uh, shelf longevity next uh, Sunday. If he will not be there, then we can uh, dive in the key minerals for photosynthesis. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, I appreciate uh, for your time and uh, we really thank the Lord for everything. And uh, I'm praying that uh, he will continue teaching us the things that uh, we don't understand and help us uh, with the minimum expenditures to be able to have uh, uh, plants that uh, can help us both for uh, ourselves and uh, in medical missionary work. Very good. Thanks, and uh, we, we can close up with a word of prayer. Okay. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time you have given us to study. And Lord, we want to know more about uh, what you are speaking to us, more so on our health.
And Father, as we explore these themes of uh, agriculture and country living and medical missionary, we pray that uh, you may endorse with uh, knowledge from above. Above all, help our lives to be sanctified and acceptable before thee. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 You have a great day. You are going to the farm. Yeah, uh, I got I got some, I got a tree I got to cut up with a chainsaw um, that we had to get removed and um, some work on the back barn. So I'm actually not really doing a lot of farming stuff today. It's more uh, other type of stuff that has to get taken care of. Okay. Okay, you have a great day then.